Okay? Everybody can hear me well in this uh, back seat? Okay, good. Good. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure to introduce Major General Kim, Army University Provost, and Deputy Commandant, Command and General Staff College. Sir? Good afternoon, everybody. Can you hear me okay in the back? Okay. Usually I just talk a lot anyway, so I don't really need the microphone. But um, anyway, it's good afternoon, it's, and, and really great to be here today, and I'm glad this is happening when I'm here in town. Uh, I miss a decent number of these things, and uh, so it's nice to be part of it. Uh, and uh, I appreciate you all being here to listen to some, you know, very important presentations uh, on some of the national security challenges and the cultural aspects of that we're going to go through today. I'm going to be brief because we really want to get the substance of this uh, august, good-looking group up front, minus the Air Force guy. Um, uh, so a special thanks to the panel members, and I know they'll get introduced here in a minute, so I'm not going to do that, do that twice. Uh, but not just thanks to them, but also thanks to all the, uh, the, the non-present authors who, who helped contribute to the, uh, to the book uh, and the effort there, and it's very important. You know, so today's session is on that book, Cultural Perspectives, Geopolitics, Energy, Security of Eurasia, Is the Next Glo Global Conflict Imminent? Um, and a couple things to know. This is really the first formal product kind of working together uh, between Army Univ University Press and the Cremo team. Um, and it's really trying to, it kind of helps demonstrate how the merging of the Army University Press and, and the support it can give across the Army. So I appreciate that part of it. And it's a really a rare opportunity to have a, a mix that we don't often get between the Army, the Air Force, DIA, Department of State, in that, in that book, in other places, uh, and academically co collaborating uh, on this important topic. And as you all know very well, at CGSC, we've really focused on the operational level of war. Um, we spend a lot of time looking at how to plan and conduct military operations um, in support of higher level missions, direction. We talk a lot about uh, leaving options for the commander. How does the staff set conditions and, and bring decisions to bear to, to tee them up properly? Um, and how you plan and execute those operations. But we all know that those deficiencies directly affect the strategic outcomes and rely very heavily on really cohesively understanding the operating environment. Uh, and that's a struggle. It's, it's very much more difficult for the United States in many ways because as a, as a global military and a global country, uh, we have challenges in, from the Arctic to Eurasia to Europe that most countries don't see, they don't have that same level. They tend to be able to focus in a narrower part of just their region. Uh, so it really is hard for us in many ways because what operating environment are we talking about? Which culture do you want to focus on? Which languages do you want to focus on? We don't know because we, we don't get to pick where we're going to be sent next. Um, so these military decisions and, and thinking about culture and our adversaries and our friends is vitally important. And Army leaders at all echelons must be able to recognize and adapt in stride. Uh, and we all know there's people who do that well and people who don't do that well. There's units that do that well. There's units that don't do that well. Uh, and the ones that do, it's because they think in advance and they study and are and trying to figure out how are we going to do that when we don't know exactly what, what we're going to do next. And we all know we've seen in the last 15, 20 years, you see throughout history, the outcomes when you don't get that right. Uh, and our job, uh, whether you're a civilian faculty, military faculty, or a student, is to make sure that we're working our best to get it right. We won't get it perfect, but we got it close enough that we can, you know, do the right thing. So forums like this are an important part of doing that better. Um, as you know, our, our moderator here today is uh, Dr. Mihir Ibrahimov uh, from the uh, Krell Management Office, which is part of the Army U team. Really thankful for you for helping to moderate this today and put it together. Um, and bringing together his regional expertise and his passion that we all know about. Um, you know, as leaders and strategists that are part of DOD, it's really typical that we see things through the regional or COCOM eyes or our service eyes or whatever kind of framing you come from. Um, I think this book and the panel, uh, panel is going to elaborate a little further on the importance of looking from different frameworks, looking from different views. Uh, the, the potential conflicts, you know, as just me having been a lieutenant in Germany during the Cold War when I start, very first started, you naturally have a west to east look, right? That's just how you think, right? I had a, my, my, my engineer platoon had, had an obstacle belt that was started five kilometers from the Czech border and all kinds of stuff. So there's a natural west east look. But if you really want to understand the culture, you also have to, if you think about that part of the country, you have to think east to west also. You can't just look at how you see things, you got to look from the other side. And so this is a great opportunity to help do that. 
um, and really help think about the cultural and strategic drivers that are so important to all of us. So with that, I'm going to uh, get off the stage uh, without any more blathering by me. So let's get started. Thanks. Well, thank you, sir. We appreciate your leadership and continued support of our efforts. My name is Mahir Ibrahimov. I am the program manager of Armenian Culture, Regional Expertise, and Language Management Office, CRELMO. Today, CRELMO's next Army Watt panel is organized in conjunction with Army University Press, Army University, and CJC. The topic is cultural perspectives geopolitics and energy security of Eurasia. Is the next global conflict imminent? Is a book discussion with editors and authors. Volume one of the anthology was published by the Army U Press and written under the auspices of Krelmo with the foreword by Major General Kim. You can see the direct links of the book and related video interviews on the bottom of the slide. Next slide, please. Before we start the session, we would like to extend our sincere appreciations to our authors, who are, without any exaggeration, among the best subject matter experts across the nation in their respective areas of expertise. They made this project a great success. Ambassador Hoagland, Dr. King, Colonel Slate, Mr. Ada, Dr. Isaac, Mr. Kurz, Mr. Harbin, Chaplain George, Major Mines. This anthology is a good example of collaborative effort between interagency partners, universities, think tanks, CGSC schools and departments, as well as the related offices such as Trade of G2's, FIMSO, we have the representative here, I believe. Thanks for, thanks for coming, Rob. We would also like to thank the Army Ukraine team for their great support and dedication to the project. Thank you very much, Dr. Wright. The opinions and discussions points during the panel are those of the authors and do not necessarily represent official positions of the United States government. By the way, I apologize for my lovely global accent, whatever it is. Uh, the ontology includes the chapters from a wide range of regions, including the former USSR, the Middle East, Western Hemisphere, East Asia, Southwest Asia, Caucasus, etc. This broad approach reflects the fact that regional and global geopolitics are interconnected socioculturally, economically, and historically. The chapters provide a deep analysis and comprehensive information of historical, sociocultural, economic aspects of all the mentioned regions' countries. They also provide analysis of major aspects, deep historical roots of global and regional concepts and phenomena such as Eurasianism, political Islam, among others, with the major related philosophical and political schools of thought to a certain extent explaining the roots of the insurgency and terrorism in different regions of the greater Eurasian landscape, tackling the difference between the insurgency and terrorism. By the way, it is not the same, as you can read in the book. Okay? So, several chapters of the book describe the beginnings and current approaches of the U.S. Army's culture and language program and its continuous importance for our military missions in and among indigenous cultures, such as those in Eurasia. Chapters also provide first-hand observations and analysis of the lessons learned from Ukraine, Syria, and other regions and countries. I was pleased to go to Ukraine together with Mr. Kurz last May and to have those observations as a part of the Army study. It was emphasized there is a gap and lack of understanding and appreciation by the U.S. of the indigenous cultures, including those of Eurasia region. The new generation warfare in courts is already ongoing in Ukraine, Baltics, Moldova, and other regions. Operations are occurring within the gray zone 
The panel members' observations and expertise will provide a valuable insight to help better understand and contextualize the current and emerging realities of this critical region for our national security interests. Also, a wide range, I want to pay your, your attention to this, a wide range of original sources in Arabic, Chinese Mandarin, Turkish, Russian, Spanish, Azerbaijan, etc., which were utilized by the authors, clearly indicate to the great combined language aptitude which added to the value, value and significantly enhanced the project. Think about it. Today, we will focus on three chapters to generate the discussion. Speakers include, from left to right, Colonel Gentile, Director, Air Force Element, CJC, Dr. Babb, Associate Professor, Department of Military History, and Dr. Hernandez, Acting Director, Graduate Degree Programs. The initial remarks by the authors for about five, seven minutes were followed by Dr. Wright, Deputy Director, Army U Press, with the summary and comments of the discussion. The rest of the time will be devoted to questions, answers, comments from the audience, including the outstations links through VTC. The entire session is being video recorded and will be posted on Crelmo website for further training and educational purposes. Before we proceed with the panel, I would like to quickly share some Kremlin's capabilities for the past, today's, and future events. Next slide, please. This is the Kremlin's ATM homepage. You can see some of the organizations in the bottom of the page we are closely working on leveraging with. Okay, if you click on the logo of Krelmo, it will get you, next slide please, to the Krelmo's public domain page. By the way, we also established the Krelmo digital library right here. So we placed our newest book there among, our, among other uh, publications, related publications. If you click on program documents, articles, and links of interest. Next slide, please. So it will get you to the upper portion of the target page. If you scroll down, next page, please. Slide, please. So this is where our, the video of the entire today's session is going to be posted, on the conferences, seminars, or forums. If you scroll further down, you could see more capabilities, video slides, publications of other events, DOD and nationwide, which we attended and presented. Next slide, please. So with this, uh, without further ado, I would like to yield the floor to Colonel Gentile for his initial remarks based on his chapter in the shadow of destruction, how nuclear weapons underwrite Russia's global strategy. Colonel Gentile, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Dr. I. Before I begin, I want to take a moment and recognize someone who's been instrumental in the development of this book. Uh, most people are unaware of the amount of, uh, of energy that this individual has put into the book. Uh, it was his idea. He built the team. He built the relationships. He provided the vision, the energy, the guidance helped get us through an 18 month long process and quite frankly the book would not have been complete uh, and we would not be sitting here today if it wasn't for the leadership, the energy and the vision of, uh, of Dr. I. So sir, from all of us to you, thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to introduce my chapter today. Uh, it's really focused around Russia's use of nuclear coercion to achieve its strategic objectives and how it backstops uh, what we are seeing around the world as it's operating inside the gray zone. Uh, the three main points that I'm going to talk about today, first off, is defining what is nuclear coercion and what are those Russian activities that fall on inside that category. Uh, from there, I'm going to take you and make you have to take a look at the world from the Russian perspective so you can understand why 
Putin is using nuclear coercion to achieve those strategic objectives. And lastly, we're going to take a, a look at some historic examples uh, of things that the U.S. and the West have used in order to effectively uh, alter Soviet and Russian uh, aggression without escalation to, towards general conflict. Slide, please. So what is nuclear coercion? Uh, simply, it is the use uh, or the threat of use of nuclear weapons during a conflict in order to affect the strategic calculus of another nation. Uh, in its simplest form is, uh, I have interests and I'm willing to use my nuclear weapons to protect my interests and whether or not you think I will, is that, uh, are you willing to call my bluff? Uh, and as, uh, as often said is, uh, are you willing to trade Kiev for a field army? And that's essentially what, what Russia is doing with regards to its nuclear coercion. Uh, now what you see listed up here is, uh, Threat is only uh, is, is only as good as its credibility, and so what we're seeing what you see on the board going from the top left down is uh, just a sampling of activities from Russia that led credence and credibility to this nuclear threat. First and foremost, they have the largest stockpile of nuclear weapons in the world. Every type of variant, uh, whether it's air delivered, ballistic missile delivered, uh, sea launch ballistic bl missile delivered, uh, they have it. So they have a very credible threat. Now, just because you have a stockpile doesn't mean that your threat or the ability to use it is credible. However, what we have seen uh, really since Russia's intervention in, in Crimea and more importantly in, uh, in Syria is a use of weapons, uh, major weapon systems that would be more aligned with a nuclear force, uh, whether it's Tu-160 bombers, uh, Su-30, Su-34 aircraft, air launch cruise missiles, sea launch cruise missiles. Uh, understandably, there is, there is no good operational or strategic need to use those weapons in Syria. Uh, the Russians have been invited into Syria by the Syrian government, and ISIS lacks a credible air defense threat. So there is no threat to the aircraft. So the only explanation for using these, air, these weapons is to show the world that we are a nuclear power, we have capability, and it is credible. So again, goes to that credibility piece. The last bit of this, uh, and what you see there with uh, is their IO campaign associated with their nuclear weapons. Whether that is the quote-unquote inadvertent release of uh, secret documents regarding nuclear torpedoes, the flying of nuclear capable bombers inside of U.S. and NATO air defense zones, or the surfacing of nuclear capable submarines inside the territorial waters of, uh, of NATO countries, this furthers that, that overt communication that we are a nuclear nation, we have interests and we are willing to use nuclear weapons to protect that. Now some, some folks might say, well, why, would, why would Mr. Putin risk that? Why would the Russians risk, uh, at worst, a nuclear war or at best a return to the Cold War? Is he crazy? Viewed from our perspective, those are, uh, those are reasonable questions. However, slide please. If we view the world from the Russian perspective, we see something completely different. Uh, first, this, this is not my observation. I'm not the one, I didn't look at this and say, oh, this is, this is Russian nuclear coercion. This is actually overtly published uh, in Russian strategic documents. Much like the United States, they publish uh, some of their high-level strategic documents. And in the 2010 National Military Strategy of the Russian Federation, they overtly published the following. It says, Russia reserves the right to use nuclear weapons in response to the use of nuclear and other types of weapons of mass destruction. That should be no surprise to anybody. Uh, we have a similar strategy published. However, there's a further addendum to this that is, is of concern. It says, also, in case of aggression against Russia with the use of conventional weapons when the existence of the very state is threatened, Russia will employ nuclear weapons. What does that mean? Doesn't spell it out, it's left very vague. What it is meant to do is meant to force Western leaders, world leaders, to assess the situation and go, I don't know, would they use nuclear weapons in this situation? More importantly, am I willing to even take that risk? And that's what the, that's what the Russians are trying to drive. Now, as you back that up, uh, why? Why would they choose that strategy? Simply, they can, 
and they must. First off, again, they have the largest nuclear force, and it is capable of delivering those nuclear, uh, that nuclear stockpile. So they can. They also believe that the West abhors casualties. And so the threat of mass casualties, they think, will get inside of our strategic calculus and force Western leaders to really say, I don't know, am I really willing to trade a field army for Tallinn or Kiev? Uh, now, I said the other part is they must. When you look at it from the perspective of the Russians, first off, they feel surrounded. On their western border, they have what they would say is the encroachment of NATO into former Soviet spheres of influence. Along the southern border, you have China with its 2.3 million person army, a massive land boundary, and an insatiable desire to consume resources that exist with inside the heartland of Russia. And on their eastern boundary, you have US and US allies dominating the Pacific. So from their perspective, they feel surrounded. That's furthered by the fact that the Russian economy does not allow them to maintain a conventional force that could offset those threats. The Russians have approximately 270,000 folks on active duty, with about another 750,000 in the reserves. Well, NATO alone has a 1.4 million person army. You've got China with 2.3 million, and then you've got your Western allies on, or, or, or allies in the Pacific on top of that. They just cannot afford to protect their interests with conventional forces alone. So they have to backstop what they're doing with those nuclear threats. Now, what was interesting as I, as I researched this is this is nothing new. The United States actually, and, and NATO, did this in the 50s and 60s. At the, after the completion of World War II and the decimation of the European economy, a decision was made that instead of keeping a conventional force that could offset the five million man Soviet army, we would maintain a, a force forward deployed, backstopped by, by nuclear weapons. Now most of us are familiar with uh, mutually assured destruction, uh, where we'd be volleys back and forth and we'd wipe out the world. And that, that, that deterrent effect was meant to prevent a nuclear war. However, there were other strategic theories that are, uh, that are kind of lost in history. And one of them is this theory that was developed in the United States called uh, counterforce theory. And what that was, and that was actively used in the 50s and 60s, where we knew and the Soviets knew that we did not have a conventional force that could offset their massive conventional army. So we backstopped it with tactical nuclear weapons and threats to use nuclear weapons against their fielded forces if they cross the folded gap. Now, what happened over time is in the 1970s, uh, the United States abandoned this, uh, this theory for a couple of reasons. Uh, first and foremost, all of the war games that we ran regarding uh, counterforce theory resulted in global nuclear war. Uh, we realized that there was almost no ability to control the escalation once one nuclear weapon was employed. Additionally, the U.S. global precision strike capability, whether that's stealth technology, laser-guided, GPS-guided, scene-sensing technology inside our, our secret heads, that, was, uh, that, that, that continued to develop in the 70s and really came into full bloom in the 80s and 90s. So from our perspective, we no longer needed to use uh, nuclear weapons to backstop uh, our smaller conventional forces. However, what we are seeing is, is Russia is taking a, a page out of our, uh, our playbook because they do feel threatened and they feel this is the only way that they can protect, uh, protect themselves. Uh, so this is a pretty high stakes poker match. Uh, as you imagine, a misstep in this could, uh, you know, could result in a nuclear exchange. And so as we move forward, uh, you got to look at what are the potential options that are available to the West to get Russia to fold and back down with regards to nuclear coercion. So, slide, please. Uh, what we've seen uh, historically is the Russians are, are, are paranoid about, uh, about invasion. Uh, this dates back to World War II, Operation Barbarossa, the German invasion uh, of Russia. That created a paranoia inside the Soviets and, and now Russian leaders that the West and everything that the West did was meant to undermine their, their strategic parity and, and threaten, Western, sorry, threaten Soviet and Russian leadership.
Uh, this resulted in arms races. Uh, the Cuban Missile Crisis, what most folks don't know, is that that was a result of the U.S. deploying nuclear missiles to Turkey. Uh, Soviets being very fearful of those missiles, they in turn deployed nuclear weapons to Cuba. When we developed uh, precision-guided penetrator uh, ICBMs, unbeknownst to us at the time, the Soviets developed a program called Dead Hand. And this was a computer program that was designed to launch a massive retaliatory nuclear strike if it sensed that the Soviet leadership had been decapitated. This was operationalized. It was in effect in, uh, in the early 1980s. Uh, there was a malfunction in the system that almost resulted in a complete launch of the, the Soviet nuclear uh, ballistic force against the United States. Uh, so you can see there's uh, a lot of paranoia there. Now there is one, uh, there is one main military move that, uh, that the West has employed over the years that has been met with consternation inside the Soviet and <coughs> Russian leaderships, but has not resulted in that escalation toward global conflict. And that is what you see up there. That is missile defense. Uh, when President Reagan announced his designs for the Strategic Defense Initiative, commonly referred to as Star Wars, the Kremlin and the Soviet leadership became very concerned. A lot of reasons for that. Uh, the first and foremost was their economy could not keep up with the arms race. They wouldn't be able to produce something similar. So they became very concerned that they would lose their parity with the West. Uh, but what it, in turn, what ended up happening is this brought the Soviets to the, the bargaining table and a political solution came out. And we've seen this over time with, uh, even very recently, with discussions about deploying the THAAD and other missile defense capabilities to Europe to protect the Europeans against uh, the Iranian ballistic missile threat. We see Russia become very overt, very aggressive with that, and that has actually been a bargaining chip that's allowed uh, the U.S. and the West to stymie Russian aggression and, and essentially protect some of our strategic, in, uh, sorry, our strategic interests without going to, to nuclear conflict. So as we move forward, uh, recommendations are that our, our leaders continue to use that leverage because it is very effective without, uh, without risking that escalation. That, uh, that concludes my opening comments. Sir, back over to you. Colonel Gentile, thank you so much for a great presentation. That was really, really interesting. So the next speaker is Dr. Babb, who will discuss the, his chapter, Eurasia's Unequal Partners, China-Russia Relations, Past, Present, Future. Dr. Babb, please. I'll briefly outline uh, my chapter and then talk about what I call the four contingencies. Trying to use history to set the context for what could happen in the future. And so I wanted to look at China-Russia relations. So as depicted on this slide, these are the, the, the various sections uh, that I talked about. Um, and I didn't want to go way back to the Mongols any more than I had to. But the early relations, uh, I make a few brief comments. But then I look mostly at the Qing Dynasty from 1644 to 1911, which is the period when Russia moves east. And, and most people do not realize Russia was mostly east of the, uh, sorry, mostly west of the Urals. As it moved to the west, uh, I'm sorry, as it moved east and settled, um, it slowly but inexorably moved to the Pacific coast. But that really did not happen until uh, the late 1600s and into the 1700s. So it's a relatively late occurring uh, event. But it came at the expense of China because as Russia moved to the east, the Qing dynasty was collapsing. And so the Russians had an opportunity um, to gain territory. And some of that territory that they gained was China, or what was claimed by Qing China. After that, we have the Republican era, 
And most people probably don't know that one of Chiang Kai-shek's sons, the one that replaced him in Taiwan as president, actually went to school in the Soviet Union. He had another son that went to school in Germany and actually served in the German army. So Chiang Kai-shek had made agreements with Stalin, had worked with Stalin, knew Stalin, and his son actually married a Russian woman and stayed in Russia for years. So there was a relationship between Chiang Kai-shek and Stalin and Russia. We tend to think only of the relationship that emerged over time in the Mao era. But in, right after the war in 1945, Chiang Kai-shek and Stalin had made a friendship treaty. Stalin actually thought that Chiang Kai-shek was going to win and not Mao. Over time, as, Mao, as Stalin looked at the situation, he kind of figured, I better just stay in both camps, and he did. He started to realize that Mao might win. And so you see a shift in the late 40s. With the Korean War, we finally are at war with Mao and Communist China over the Korean Peninsula. And China and Russia, now the, the Soviet Union, are allies. And it's sort of a block. So our understanding of how this, this relationship between Russia and China grew is important. It's also important in that Stalin doesn't like Mao, Mao doesn't like Stalin, and Stalin does not follow through during the Mao era with the promises. He does not support Mao in the Korean War with the air power that he promised. In both of the Taiwan crises, 53, 54, 57, 58, he does not back up. And in the Indian, in the Sino-Indian War of 1962, Khrushchev, now leading uh, the Soviet Union, basically backs India against their, his fellow communists. The Russians and the Chinese are both helping Vietnam. But by 1979, the Chinese will attack into Vietnam. So four years after the United States leaves Vietnam, China will attack into Vietnam. Now, back a little bit. In 1969, there actually was a little border conflict between the Russians and the Chinese. When you look at this sweep of history from the 1600s up to the present day, what you see is a very uneven relationship. And what was for many years China in the ascendancy and then descendancy, Russia in the ascendancy, descendancy, and now Russia is rising again, but China is really rising. The question now becomes, what's next? And, uh, and next slide, please. I posit four contingency areas that we should look at. And I'll just quickly go over those. <coughs> we put 24 Chinese Uyghurs in Guantanamo that we had picked up fighting in Afghanistan. I have seen numbers from 300 to 3,000 Uyghurs that are fighting or have fought for ISIS in Iraq and Syria. So the United States, Russia, and China actually share a common enemy. So this could make for some very strange relationships in Central Asia should the caliphate survive and expand. And one of the problems with expansion is most of the nations in Central Asia are still ruled by the Soviet SSR leadership. And so what's going to happen in Central Asia as these leaders change? T to be determined. And what's going to happen uh, if within one of those states this Islamic caliphate happens to not only survive, but spread. And we can think about that spread not 
as, as overt, but as, as underground. So that contingency one is this potential Islamic future. The, second, the other one is, what are we going to do about North Korea? North Korea brings China, Russia, Japan, and the United States back into this strange relationship. And I argue for contingency. I firmly believe that if unannounced North Korea attacks South Korea, the Chinese will not back North Korea. Jeff Babb's personal opinion. There are other contingencies where it might not be as clear. There's no doubt that China is going to play some role in the post-conflict on the Korean Peninsula. What happens with Japan? Does the next year or two years or three years and what develops in North Korea cause Japan to rearm? And where does that set the theater? So the Northeast Asia theater that began with the Russians taking Vladivostok and then actually getting the warm water port of Dalian from China back at the end of World War II is still there. And 50 years before that had been the Russo-Japanese War, which the Japanese had thoroughly defeated the Russians in that part of the world. Back to, back to history. The third is the economics and resource. And for those reading the papers lately, one belt, one road. The Chinese are inexorably building um, a resource bridge back all the way through Russia, arguably into Iran in the Middle East, and arguably down into Africa. So there's a very interesting uh, article that was just published uh, by Robert Kaplan. It's called The Return of Marco Polo's World and the U.S. Military Response. And Henry Kissinger reading this says it's one of the most important articles that he's read. So I highly recommend this article because it talks exactly to this problem of what's happening in the future and how are we going to respond to this piece. And last but not least is, in some ways, what is probably the most long-term likely. The Russians and the Chinese hate each other. There's not an easier way to say it. They've never really got along. One has always been subservient to the other in one way, shape, manner, or form, and got along because they had to. But a China with the upper hand, and uh, I'll, I'll try to give you the, statistic, the, the, the numbers. <clears throat> the Russians versus the Chinese east of the Urals are striking. 4.3 million Russians versus 109 million Chinese. The population differences in Russia east of the Urals and the growing Russian, the Chinese population moving north and northeast has the distinct possibility of causing geographic and demographic uh, dislocations in the future. And in some ways, the fourth one is the one that's most highly debated. Can the Chinese move in to what is called maritime Russia, farm there, produce there, build factories there, and not disturb Russia's sovereignty there? If you think the answer is yes, then we could see, continue to see an accommodation between the two. But if at the end of the day, the Russians care about their sovereignty, and I think they do, it could pot potentially lead uh, to another 1969 on a much larger scale. So the history will talk to us about the future contingencies. So look forward to your questions. Thank you very much, Dr. Beth, for another very interesting uh, remarks on uh, China-Russia relations. So at this time, uh, Dr. Hernandez's topic is also very important, related to, is related to Cuban-American uh, relations. 
Dr. Hernandez, the floor is yours. Thank you, Dr. Ibrahimov, and uh, thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for being present in this, in this panel. Uh, my topic, as you can determine from the title, is rather an outlier from the, uh, the focus that the book has on Eurasia as a, uh, as a center of attention. Uh, however, it, it links to Eurasia in this sense. Um, I'm focusing on the island nation of Cuba, which is uh, in our hemisphere, in the Western Hemisphere. And uh, my, the lens that I'm using to observe this is uh, the interest that both uh, Russia under Putin and China have on, on, uh, on uh, the Western Hemisphere, and particularly on Cuba, and also on the troubled relationship that uh, the United States government has had with Cuba, uh, not only since the uh, Spanish-American War of 1898, but even in the half century predating that. So what I uh, start up uh, describing is, as Dr. Babs uh, uh, just mentioned to you, taking a long historical view of the situation uh, with the intent for us to, with that awareness in mind, so that we can understand the current developments in the light of this long history, uh, historical perspective. So my article deals with Cuba and the interest that the U.S. has, as well as the interest that the two largest Eurasian powers have, uh, China and Russia. Um, I have to note that uh, even though, uh, you know, I've, I'm Hispanic, my, my name is Hernandez, I am not Cuban, so I have a, some distance, emotional distance from the topic. However, since an, uh, I was a young man or a young uh, boy, I have known Cubans that have escaped from Cuba, Castro's Cuba, so I have had an interest in those developments. And uh, also I have followed that situation very carefully. It also links with uh, two classes that I teach, uh, history and, cl and cultures of the Caribbean area and wargaming the Cuba Wars. And, and uh, I think we as Americans uh, look towards Eurasia, look towards the South China Sea today, look towards the Middle East, and fail miserably looking at our own backyard and overlook it, and not, not only overlook it, but also uh, neglect it, neglect it from a diplomatic perspective. And that's part of the arguments that I will take up here. Um, as of the publication of this article, uh, things have changed. Things are continuing to change. That is the danger of publishing on current events, obviously. Uh, so you will, you will understand now that there's a couple of things that I will update you in about that are not reflected on the article. For example, since the publication of my, art, my article, my chapter, uh, Fidel Castro died. Okay? He died 25 November last year. Uh, that was, uh, it, it, as far as, as we know, hasn't made a huge impact on the relationship, but he was certainly the father figure of the Cuban Revolution. So he died. Um, a little bit before that, uh, we had in the previous administration, U.S. administration, we had Secretary Kerry declaring that for all intents and purposes, the Monroe Doctrine is, is, is no longer in force. And we are still uh, at, at a loss to find out what that really means at this, this age in time and, and space. Um, we also know that Mr. Putin, for one, is a master of realpolitik. There's no doubt in my mind. He, he knows how to, how to use hard power, and he's increasingly mastering soft power. We have, we know beyond a shadow of a doubt that the Chinese are masters of realpolitik. And they play in centuries, not years. Uh, let me tell you a story here about China. Uh, Chinese have been in Cuba since the 19th century. They have entered, they had entered the island as indentured laborers, and Havana had the largest Chinatown in the 1950s before the revolution. And that's just to put some thoughts in your mind here. And as you know, after the Cuban Revolution, uh, Castro and the, the Soviet leadership had a a very uh, intense relationship, even though at times troubled, right? So what is the picture now? Well, we have these power brokers with an intent 
to maximize their strategic reach in our backyard, in the Caribbean, right? 90 miles from the Florida Keys. Uh, look at the other side of the world, and we have Taiwan, which, according to the Chinese, is a part of China. It's a province of China, heavily armed. They have an interest in reacquiring Taiwan. So naturally, if you think in geostrategic terms, there is a natural quid pro quo. You know, I can have influence in, in uh, Cuba uh, to counterbalance the influence that you guys have in Taiwan, for example. Uh, the same applies with Russia. They had naval uh, facilities there under the Soviet leadership. They had all kinds of economic agreements, which fell to the side until P Putin wants to resurrect the Russian Empire once more in a different guise. So they, those two Eurasian powers have real interest in the Caribbean. Uh, I'm showing there in my slides what to date has been an American lake, the Caribbean, and what the Chinese uh, intend to make a Chinese lake and are taking active steps towards that, and what the Russians are perceiving due to the changes in uh, climate as their own backyard. They're claiming all kinds of resources that formerly were under the Arctic ice cap, right? So there you have the interest of those two major Eurasian powers and their, their attempt to use maritime geography to their advantage. Uh, next slide, please. Oh, here you have um, kind of an interesting slide because you have the dichotomy that is uh, the reality in Cuba right now. You have this lady dressed up in full American colors, right? And uh, no, she's looking at none other than Che, you know, who still is the revolutionary icon, icon par excellence in the region. Uh, there is this dichotomy in Cuba. You know, they like the U.S., they like us as, as individuals, but they don't want to be subservient. They don't want to be recolonized by the U.S., which was their perception following the, the Spanish-American War. So we have this dichotomy in, in embedded in Cuban culture uh, that many of us are unaware of. Uh, I, should, I should have done my talk on baseball because baseball is Cuba's national sport, perhaps even more so than now that football is overtaking baseball in this country. It is Cuba's national sport, and it predates the U.S. invasion. And, and, and there, was, there was diplomatic attempts tied to baseball. If, if you read my article, you'll see what I mean. But there is this love-hate relationship between the U.S. and Cuba, which is very much part of the conversation. And it plays out in different ways in different forums. It plays out differently in Little Havana in Miami, where you have an expatriate community that is really, until the day they die, they will be looking uh, you know, for change in Cuba, and they want no diplomacy. They, we are also experiencing the second and third generation Americans uh, have a di very different outlook. They want to go back to their roots, right? We have not only dealing, we're not only dealing with communism and neoliberalism or democracy, however you want to call it, we're dealing here with the echoes of post-colonialism, okay? And, and that's what I talk about a little bit more detail in my article as well. Uh, Cubans may like us, but they don't want to be another appendage of the United States. And maybe they're thinking the only way we can achieve that is by maintaining the socialist revolution. I mean, that, that is uh, something that Cubans are want to say at this point. Uh, next slide, please. Oh, but, uh, b before we go to the next slide, uh, yeah, let's, let's just take a look at those. Uh, those are fairly recent meetings um, with Raul Castro, Fidel's younger brother, and the leaders of Russia, China, and formerly uh, the U.S. We shall see what the uh, future brings uh, under new administrations here. But uh, certainly both Russia and China are masters of their politique. Next slide. Uh, in the news lately, if you follow Latin American news, you will see that, uh, and those are in the map uh, to your left, to your uh, lower right, as you see, the, as you look at the screen, the map shows in Chinese characters the new Nicaragua Canal, okay? That is not a fiction. Uh, negotiations have been going on for many years uh, between Chinese investors, and you can read that however you want to. Is the government involved? I would almost guarantee yes. Uh, 
Chinese investors and the government, uh, the Sandinista government of, of Nicaragua, on uh, bypassing the Panama Canal under Chinese guidance. Uh, work just started in the spring, okay? So work has started. Do not underestimate the Chinese. They, they were the ones that constructed the Great Wall of China. They also constructed the Grand Canal that uh, links the Yangtze and the Yellow River. Uh, even it was, it was labor for many centuries, but they did it. So this is, uh, some people consider it impossible, not the Chinese. Uh, it's gonna be big competition to the Panama Canal and US dominance in the region, okay? That doesn't include the amount of investment and uh, Confucius centers that are evolving throughout the region, right? Uh, on the lower right-hand side of your slide, I'm portraying the uh, division that the, uh, um, that the Cuban government has allocated what they believe to be offshore oil fields and, ga and natural gas fields uh, to a number of Russian companies, okay? Uh, as in the South, South China Sea, there is no guarantee that these resources will be available, but it is a great likelihood that they will be available and there's an intent for exploration of those resources. And they have not been given to U.S. companies, all right? They have, many of them have been given to European companies because they have been able to work, uh, go beyond ideology and, and get into that business and certainly to, to Russian companies as well. And uh, the, the graph up there shows, it's a little old, it's about a year and a half or two old, but it shows you clearly that uh, the EU is the, uh, the, the European Union is uh, now Cuba's number one trade, uh, trading partner followed by uh, China. And China is on the ascendancy in the region. Okay, the US at this point and we are only 90, 90 uh, miles offshore, are uh, number eight, okay? And eco economic uh, impact is very important in this region, very significant. So uh, this is essentially the gist of my, uh, of my um, chapter, and I just want to highlight that, uh, you know, we, had, we do have, and the Cubans do have, a love-hate relationship. It is not strictly animosity. They would like to see uh, more of us, more, more of the U.S., but for years and years, our policy has been uh, completely frozen in time in the Cold War with little acknowledgement of what's coming and with very little acknowledgement of Eurasian powers stepping into what used to be an American lake. So with that, Dr. Ibrahimov, I conclude my remarks. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Hernandez, for another great presentation. Uh, there is a saying in another culture, in fact, it's from Russian culture, that with this team, we can turn the mountain upside down. Sorry, I just translated that literally, but you understand what that means. It means that the team, and I'm honored to be part of it, has a great, great intellectual potential, endless intellectual potential. And their initial remarks prove that. So. Um, and you clearly see the connection between seemingly first very distinct regions such as Western Hemisphere, uh, uh, East Asia, or Russia, etc. You can see clearly, clearly linkage, connection, uh, culturally, historically, economically, and generally speaking, geopolitically. So with this, uh, thank you very much again. And with this, at this time, Dr. Wright, Army U Press Deputy Director will summarize the discussion with the final comments before we proceed with the questions and answers session. Dr. Wright, the floor is yours. Okay, first I'll say thank you very much for the invitation to participate in this event. Uh, it was great to be, very rewarding to be involved in this project for 18 plus months, I think, right, Lee? The traditional role of the commentator in an event like this is to weave together the presentations around a common theme and then bring out the, the larger relevant and interesting insights from those themes. And if a commentator is doing his or her job right, maybe even be a little provocative and get the questions and comments going after the event is, the formal part of the, the event is over. Well, let me first talk about the larger theme and then how I think our three speakers fit into that common thread. To state the obvious, today's panel, as well as the anthology that they contributed to, is focused on Eurasia, 
and on geography. Uh, I think what the anthology does very, very well is reorient us on geography itself. Now, maybe some in our community never really forgot about the role of geography in military and political affairs. But in the last 50 years or so, especially after the Cold War, there is perhaps a marked decrease in the, in the interest in geography as a critical or the critical fact, shaping factor in ge geopolitical affairs. At least that is the argument of a very good book by Robert Kaplan, that name comes up I think yeah. the third time today, uh, titled The Revenge of Geography, What the Map Tells Us About Coming Conflicts and the Battle Against Fate, published in 2012. I'm pretty sure many of you have read this book or know of it. What Kaplan suggests is that during and especially after the Cold War, geography as a determining factor in geopolitics was demoted, while ideas and technology seemed to rise in prominence. That is, ideas such as democracy or free markets, possibly in combination with technology, would become more important in shaping geopolitics. Now, one of the best quotes about the relationship between technology and geography comes from Colin Gray, who stated that the idea that technology canceled geography contains just enough merit to be called a plausible fallacy. The best known example of the thought that ideas had ascended over geography is likely the famous or infamous assertion from Francis Fukuyama in his 1991 book titled The End of History and the Last Man that the Cold War conflict over which system of governance should be dominant on the globe may have been decided in favor of liberal democracy and that global political ideological evolution was essentially over. There was no need to even look at these things anymore. We won. Another more recent example is Thomas Barnett's book, The Pentagon's New Map, that used to be required reading around here. I don't know if it still is. That book asserted that geopolitics was becoming more dependent on attitudes towards a set of shared assumptions that govern conflict resolution, economic relationships, individual autonomy, and other matters. Barnett called these rule sets and saw the globe divided into a functioning core that agreed on these rule sets and a non-integrated gap that consisting of those countries that rejected those rules. Now, Barnett did not completely reject or ignore geography, yet his argument is clearly premised on the idea that globalization, or connectedness as he called it, was increasingly rendering old geopolitical structures, like geography, irrelevant, or at least less important. Now, back to Kaplan's argument about the revenge of geography. Kaplan contends that geography reasserted itself into our geopolitics after 9-11. Much of the book is a reminder of how geography shaped not only the American campaigns of the global war on terror, but also previous conflicts stretching back millennia. Pride of place in Kaplan's discussion goes to Eurasia as both an idea and a physical place. Kaplan reminds us of the strong current of thought in the early 20th century about the central role of Eurasia in world history. And by far the best known advocate of this idea was Halford McKinder, whose 1904 article titled The Geographical Pivot of History identified the core of Eurasia, Russia and China, as the heartland that largely determined geopolitics at the macro level. He went further to contend that whoever controlled Eastern Europe controlled this heartland and thus world affairs. Interestingly, he identified the period between 1500 and 1900, what he calls the Columbian epoch, as a short break from the dominance of Eurasia. But once Europeans had established themselves in the Americas, Eurasia returned to its dominant position. This may sound counterintuitive for those who think of the 20th century as the American century. However, if it was the American century, it re was really only that because the U.S. bothered to get involved in Eurasian affairs, hmm. starting around 1900. And I'm thinking here of, of the Mideast as part of Eurasia, as the southwest corner of Eurasia. All of, military, uh, I'm sorry, all of America's major military operations of the last 115 years have been conducted on the Eurasian landmass. That fact may undermine the cliché that one should always avoid getting involved in a land war in Asia, usually attributed to MacArthur, but also in The Princess Bride. I think, yeah. Um, even if the U.S. was to adopt a semi-isolationist foreign policy, avoiding military operations in Eurasia may not be optional today or in the future. So this is all the context, I think, for the three presentations we heard today. Lee Gentile reminded us that Russia is still a formidable power, even if its military strength resides primarily in its nuclear weapons. It still has natural resources, and more importantly, the will to assert itself as a great power. Russia's economic and social future may not be bright, as Lee told us, 
Yet there it is firmly ensconced on what Mackinder called the pivot of history. Many of the geographic imperatives that shaped its energies in the past, lack of easily defensible borders, lack of access to warm water ports still inform its politics and strategy. And with this nuclear arsenal, Russia's pursuit of these geopolitical goals cannot be dismissed. So for Lee, the question on Russia, I think, is what possible future developments will alter these goals? What's, what might change all of that? What, for example, would be the effect of an Arctic Ocean, as Prisco mentioned, an Arctic Ocean that is free of ice for much of the year in the not-so-distant future? Could that possibly provide an outlet for Russia's strategic drive? Jeff Babb's presentation shifts the focus from the main Eurasian hub to the east along the dividing line between the Russian and Chinese states. As Jeff points out, for over 400 years, relations between those two states have shifted between amity and cooperation on the one hand and outright hostility on the other. Even when ideologies might have led to, to closer cooperation, realpolitik, the vital and long-term interests of the state, asserted themselves and often led to a fractious relationship. But that relationship argu arguably often led to a kind of balance, equilibrium. Neither of the two powers could pursue their objectives unchecked. So for Jeff, how does China's pursuit of natural resources in Africa, which you did mention, and maybe uh, more importantly, strategic outposts in the South China Sea affect that equilibrium? And then you did talk about that uh, to some degree. Prisco Hernandez, your presentation today uh, is also tied to Eurasian dominance in the sense that Russian and Chinese involvement in Cuba and parts of Latin America may be best understood as the continuation of Eurasia's assertion of geopolitical dominance in the Americas that began around 1900. So if you buy all this thought of Mackinder, this is Eurasia asserting itself back into the rest of the world after that Columbi Colombian interlude. Obviously, this is not just true in Havana or Managua or Caracas. It is also true maybe in Long Beach, where Chinese shipping containers dominate that American port. And it's not just Chinese goods, but also Chinese soft power more broadly. You also mentioned that. And Russian soft power, which recently has expanded beyond Venezuela and begun to look to Peru and Brazil as markets for military hardware. So for Prisco, where does U.S. strategy go in relation to the Americas? To what degree is the Monroe Doctrine really dead? Should it still be alive? And to take, to take a further step, shouldn't we be stabilizing Mexico or Haiti rather than Syria? Before I turn the floor over to the panel and the audience, I should note that I am not arguing that geography is the determining factor in future geopolitics. In fact, as a historian, I lay claim to no powers of prediction whatsoever, <laughs> and certainly would not claim that we are all prisoners of geography. The human experience is far too complex uh, for that type of facile generalization. The presentations and the anthology they are derived from do, however, rightfully return our focus, I think, to the significance of geography and world affairs. And perhaps that is where future research should be directed. How, based on the trends we've heard discussed today, should the U.S. Army as the current dominant global land force factor in Eurasia and other geographic factors, how should it look at Eurasia and other geographic factors uh, in consideration of its future doctrine, its organization, the way it's equipped, the way it treats culture and training soldiers to, to operate in other cultures, uh, and otherwise prepare it for, its, uh, for its future. And I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Dr. Wright, thank you so much for a great summary uh, of the book and of the presentations. So now is the time for another fascinating stage of the session. I would think the, probably the most fascinating, which are the questions answers and comments. Is everybody doing well? Is everybody doing well? Sure. Excellent. Um, thank you so much. Okay, please introduce yourself, ask a question, or make a comment. Please use the microphones on the table and make sure that the green light is on. If you sit in the back, we have microphones across the room. Please use the microphones because entire session is be, being video recorded. Otherwise, we'll not be able to video record uh, the session. So we also have, as we mentioned in the beginning, multiple outstations, and they're welcome to participate in the discussion at any time. Now, the floor is yours. Sir, the first question, please. Yeah, uh, Alfred Thayer Mahan, Department of History. No, actually, I'm John Kuhn. I'm from the Department of History. 
Um, and of course, he's the other great geopolitician of the late 19th century. Um, yeah, I, my question's for Jeff, and it's a question. Uh, so I heard you say that there's a demographic imbalance east of the Ural Mountains. Now, is this exterior to, exterior to China between 4.2 million Russians and you said, I think, 100 million Chinese? Is that, uh, does that mean there's 100 million ethnic Han Chinese in, in, former, in Russia and former Soviet Russian uh, uh, domains? It's, it's normally mentioned within 100 miles of the Russian border. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Anybody else, please? So, Go ahead. Yes, sir. Please. Please introduce yourself and... Yes, sir. Dr. Tom Ward uh, from the Department of Logistics. Uh, your uh, diagram of the three lakes I thought was very fascinating, but it appeared that there's a lake missing, that the Indian Ocean and its impact and India as a um, potentially very powerful and influential force that we don't tend to take very seriously at the moment, uh, but probably should. Your comments, sir. I think, I, Tom, I think that was for me. That was my slide. Uh, yeah, I, I fully agree with you. Uh, I limited uh, to three um, uh, smaller portions of the, of the world ocean uh, on purpose, but I, I fully concur with uh, your assessment of the Indian Ocean. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, again, going back to Robert Kaplan, he has an entire book devoted to that uh, on the, what is it, on the monsoons or and also his newest production uh, that talks about uh, Southeast Asia and the South China Sea mentions in passing the, uh, the Indian Ocean as, as a place where the interest of China, India, uh, and the U.S. and, and the concept, uh, Mahanian concept of uh, nav free nav navigation in the seas all conflict. So the Indian Ocean certainly is going to be another zone of, of conflict, but I limited myself to those that are uh, more... Uh, more liable to analogy with the Caribbean at this point. But yeah, it's by all means very, very important. Uh, as a matter of fact, I have an upcoming presentation in, in June on what I'm calling the, the new seven seas, and the Indian Ocean is part of those. So thank you for your comment. Thank you very much. Uh, Colonel Cardinal? Colonel Cardinal, uh, I'm sorry. Dr. Babb. Um, so you mentioned it a little bit, but curious to hear about your thoughts about what's going on with Japan with respect to that conflict in North Korea, what they're doing. Well, there's a lot of things that are happening with Japan, and we're talking about is the next global conflict imminent. And, and you, you, you alluded to it or you touched on it because that's another factor as they're changing or they're trying to attempt to change their constitution and go back to pre-World War II type ideology and, and maybe some thoughts, and it's not all of them, but there is that move that's going on. So what's your thoughts on how Japan factors into this equation? <clears throat> that's a very tough question because if, if one just looked at President Abe and the changing of Article 9 of the Constitution, at, one would say it, it's, it's going to happen, it's going to happen sooner than later that Japan is going to rearm. But when you talk to the people that know Japan and the people of Japan, they're not ready for it. Um, which leads to the other piece is that we need to stay. So the, the rebalance, the pivot, the rebalance um, and I, it, to Asia needs to stay. And I, and I think this administration has, has said that. Um, the rearming of Japan, I think, brings on an entirely different dynamic to the region. Um, and the, you know, the Chinese were so thoroughly defeated by uh, the Japanese twice, the, the 1894-95, which was a real embarrassment, and then 37 to 45, where Japan occupied the eastern part the, of, of China, the majority of China for all intents and purposes in terms of, of personnel. So there's this long-term, um, I think the Chinese are scared of the Japanese. 
Um, they certainly don't like them very much, and they keep bringing it up with the, the, the museum in Nanjing, the Nanjing Massacre Museum, is absolutely world class. And, and it, is, it is built to, to foster the anti-Chinese uh, idea in the Chinese people. And you see that in various places around China. So the Chinese have a saying, yi yi jiri, use barbarians to fight barbarians. So we're the very convenient barbarians right now to stay in Asia and prevent the, the rise of Japan. So the more that we talk about helping Japan militarily, and you don't have to talk about it much, purchasing F-22s, J-35s, um, they've got three air, they have four aircraft carriers uh, if, you, if you use the marine version of the, the J-35. We are slowly and inexorably building a very capable Japanese military force. As a matter of fact, there are some that argue, and John Kuhn can argue with this <coughs> maybe better than I, in, in a in a naval battle today between the Japanese and the Chinese, it's a toss-up. And I would argue the Japanese would probably win it. Um, the outlier is North Korea. If North Koreans keep launching missiles at Japan, then Japan also is going to get bad, or bad plus the Japanese version of bad. Uh, and, and all of that's not in China's interest. So th the real question is, why doesn't China do more uh, to curb North Korea? And so the outlier is North Korea. Dr. Bitters, please. Yeah, Dave Bitters, resident curmudgeon. In the operations research business, we talk sometimes metaphorically and sometimes a little bit more precisely about something called an objective. And then in technical uh, exercises, we try to optimize against some sort of objective. It's not clear to me from the discussion that you folks have presented what the objectives of these players are. And I don't see how we can make any decisions and come up with policies until we know what their interests and their objectives really are. So I'd invite you to talk about that a little bit if you can. Russian objectives? Our intent was to solve all the global and regional problems at the next session, but we'll try to solve it today. Yes, any, anybody? Sure, I'll start, sir. Uh, I think trying to guess at what, what Mr. Putin's objectives are has, uh, and Soviet Russian objectives are has escaped the West for, for many, many decades. So I would say we'd probably be remiss if we were to actually try to pin it down. But uh, from a broader perspective, first off, they, they want to regain their dominance in their region and they want to be seen as a global power and so think there are some specifics that go along with that first off is military power economic power uh, cultural power to a certain extent uh, I think from the Russian perspective culture probably falls at the bottom uh, with military probably at the top the problem there is you have to have economic power to be a global military power so I, I think what we're, we're going to see, uh, at least in, on the western, uh, the western border, is you're going to see Russia continue to uh, create problems for the further expansion of NATO. That, we're going to see that. We're going to see them in, in every which way they can. They are going to find ways to cause problems with NATO. Uh, as Jeff alludes to, down in the south, uh, you know, you've got the border with, with, with China. Yeah, they have a vested interest in keeping the Chinese out of there. How they go about trying to convince the Chinese to stay out, I, I think that's to be determined. I think in their best interest would be some sort of economic agreements, but I'm also not Mr. Putin. Uh, to go to Don's question about what happens when the Arctic melts uh, and that becomes you know, a, a, an area where we can transit. Will we see a release of, uh, of aggression along the borders? I don't think so. I think we'll see just the opposite. Uh, we are going to see uh, the U.S., Canada, and the Scandinavian countries contest any Russian claims that are inside the Arctic. So I think you'll see them further their aggression because they now have – 
Uh, they have to have a naval force in the Pacific. They have to have land forces in the south and on the east and another naval force up in the north. So I think that we will potentially see an increase in their, in their rhetoric there as they try to secure the access to the resources that are in the, in the Arctic. Anybody else? China, China's objectives? If, if you get Jeff Babb, the panda hugger, the, it, it, <laughs> it's basically don't worry. Um, it's at least 20 years before they're ready to compete against us. And at the end of the day, we have more complementary interests than contradictory interests globally. Uh, I, you know, Arkansas and Walmart is the 30th province of China. Um, on the other side is a brand new book by Graham Allison, the Harvard professor, who talks about the Thucydides trap. Um, and, and I, the, and the, it, the, looking at the inevitability of a conflict between China and the United States. My favorite book right now to talk to students to read is Kissinger's book on China. At the end of that book, he basically says that China and the United States can avoid war. I think the first thing you have to say is, who in their right mind goes to war with one-fifth of mankind? What triggers that? And I think you can look at that from the, from the Chinese perspective. What does China have to gain by going to war with us? So for that, I believe Graham Allison's book comes out on the 30th of May. Um, Pre-order it on the Amazon and get a better answer. Yeah, from, from my perspective, I would, from my perspective, I would say that I concur with uh, my colleagues here, and I also say that um, for me, it's very clear that in the case of China and Taiwan, Cuba is a perfect quid pro, quid pro, pro quo. It's it's the equivalent in in our backyard to Taiwan in theirs. Uh, and Russia obviously has had a 50-plus uh, years relationship that they want to reestablish, as Putin wants to reestablish uh, their, uh, uh, what in his mind might be his rightful place in, in the geopolitical game again. Uh, so those are, are fairly clear. The one thing that I want to highlight that is often uh, put aside is that we're talking about, uh, you know, three major powers, but we forget that Cuba has a vote. You know, Cuba has a say, and if you remember the, the Cuban Missile Crisis, one of the things that really ticked off Fidel Castro at, the point, at that time was he was ready to go and die uh, for communism, for his socialist ideas, and Khrushchev was not willing to let him die. Uh, the decisions were made without consulting him, and that triggered a few years of very rough uh, relationships between uh, Fidel Castro's Cuba and, and uh, Soviet Russia uh, at the time, the Soviet, uh, the Soviet Union. Uh, so people forget that uh, Cubans have a vote and that Cubans uh, really like the American people as people, uh, although they don't necessarily like our policy and they don't necessarily like our government. So that is what obscures often this, this, uh, this relationship. And it, uh, another thing that I would like to bring to your attention is, you know, I'm on my third Vietnamese officer that I have either been a chair for or a reader for in the MMAS program. Vietnam is a communist country today, right? And I've, I'm on my third student here at CGSC that I have advised. We have a good relationship. They're opening Cameron Bay to our, to our Navy at this point. They want, they want us there. They want us as a counterbalance to the, the increasing Chinese presence. So I see no rational reason why we cannot open uh, to Cuba other than uh, our looking to the back, to, to the past, and uh, basically sticking with these old policies that have not worked and will not work. So I offer that uh, to you as food for thought. Thank you very much. Anybody else? If I may to add uh, uh, to those great points, uh, we provided the conclusion in the book. If you read the book, you can see uh, kind of what we're talking about in terms of answering the Dr. Bitter's question. Um, at this point, uh, we have multiple collided interests, uh, geopolitical interests, not necessarily uh, coinciding. So sometimes we are, as the United States, as the, w as the West, expecting other countries, other cultures to do the same what we are expecting them to do. It's not going to happen because the cultures, histories, 
are different. That's why we're talking about the concept of Eurasianism, which helps us to step in the shoes of the adversary, because if we don't understand the adversary, we cannot achieve our national security objectives. Does that make sense? So that's kind of a uh, conclusion we make in the book overall, because it's easy uh, if we have another global conflict, uh, hopefully not, but if we do, it's going to be a different scale because multiple players have the nuclear weapons. So we need both more, more important, what is important is, and more difficult, to avoid that conflict. In order to avoid that conflict, we need to find the points of collaboration, the points of cooperation. In order to make, I would use this simplistically, the verbiage, as comfortable all the players, which is not easy. Again, we have our na own national security interests. We are not going to withdraw from world affairs, and we should not withdraw from world affairs. But we also need to keep in mind that the world get to, got to, to a very dangerous point right now, which could lead, to, could, lead, could lead to unpredictable consequences. So, sir, your question? Uh, very quickly, uh, Harry Lay from the Department of Military History. For Colonel Gentile, you mentioned um, the potential of Russia coming into conflict with NATO. Uh, among the, the menu of options that they have for using nuclear weapons for coercion, could you comment on the idea of escalate to de-escalate of, say, in the Baltics, uh, you know then what I'm referring to? Could you comment on that? Yeah, yeah. So that's essentially what uh, well, was discussed about. Say, are you, are you willing to trade your field army for, for Talan? Are you willing to trade your field army for, for Kiev? Uh, the Russians realize that they cannot match up to, to the U.S. and NATO when it comes to a, a force on force conventional fight. So, we, you know, taking a look at what's been going on inside of, of Ukraine, I uh, you know, we all talked about the hybrid warfare, little green men, et cetera, et cetera. What was missing out of a lot of the conversations was the n Russian nuclear force that was on full alert, armed, ready to go to employ uh, against a, a NATO field army if a NATO field army were to, uh, were, were to actively get involved in the fight. Uh, and so the Russians think, I mentioned that <clears throat> our counterforce theory kind of died on the vine because we believed in our war games that escalation couldn't be stopped. But the Russians see it very differently. And the Russians see it differently because they look at the West, they look at the U.S. and say, the U.S. and the West abhors casualties. So if they brought in an army and we dropped a, a low-yield nuclear weapon and destroyed, uh, killed 10,000 soldiers, it would end. That's what the Russians believe. They believe that we wouldn't retaliate in kind because we would be concerned about the, the casualties and then back and forth. I say that's a gamble on their part. I don't know if, uh, if Western leaders would. Now, uh, it also may be a different story for the U.S. wanting to push and do a retaliatory nuclear strike, whereas our European partners may say no, because what comes next? Is it going to be Paris? Is it going to be London? So I think there, there, there's some complications with the escalate, de-escalate, but that is why they believe that they could escalate and then stop the conflict by going after one of our field armies. Thank you. Cool. Yes, sir. Please introduce yourself. Uh, Major Bryson Tennel, uh, Colonel Gentile. So given Russians, uh, Russia's small economy, it's roughly the size of uh, Italy, it's dwindling uh, population, uh, it also has you know, the largest land uh, borders mm -hmm. in the world. Um, it, uh, how effective, I guess, where does, so where does their nuclear strategy fall within their overall national strategy? Because they have a lot of problems that cannot be solved with nukes. Um, Chechens, really what's going on in the Ukraine, um, all their borders, and even what's going on in, in Central Asia and their desire sure. for, for emphasis there, that does require a lot of manpower, that does require a lot of, of emphasis. So how, how does this fall within the calculus of their overall national strategy? Uh, it's, it is first and foremost, it is right up front. They pulled it out of their recent national strategy, and I think that's due to some developments, uh, some advances in their, in their own military technology. Uh, we're not saying they feel like they're on par with the, U, with the U.S. and the West, but they feel like their, their new weapon systems have been very effective in the current fights. Now, when you're the, all the fights that you're talking about 
yes, they are manpower intensive, but they are nowhere near as manpower intensive as a full force on force uh, major combat operation with the West. So their use of nuclear weapons is 100% designed to keep outside nations out of those conflicts. You know, yes, would we, would we go, uh, potentially go after the Kremlin and remove them for it, what's going on in, in Ukraine? I mean, history says maybe, right? You, know, you look at Serbia, you, you look at Iraq, Afghanistan, Libya, we have a tendency to remove leaderships and governments that don't play nicely with, uh, w w with the world order. And so their sole design with the use of the nuclear weapons is to insulate themselves to prevent the West from that decapitation strike. Is that answers your question, sir? Uh, I mean, yes, it does. <clears throat> At the same time, I guess, where, where do those threats fall within their own calculus? I mean, are they so oriented on uh, their paranoia of, of NATO just further encroaching that that, it, that becomes the, the primary regardless of you know, whatever's happening on the eastern flank, whatever's happening in Georgia, uh, there are attempts in the Middle East. So uh, what, the, what they're seeing is they're having success with their conventional forces. You know, mm -hmm. Success, I think, is probably debatable, but it, it's, it's successful enough. Uh, there's some thoughts that maybe the use of those nuclear forces in Syria was not just a demonstration to the world, but also hey, if things don't go so well with this anti-ISIS fight, maybe we will just drop a nuclear weapon on ISIS. Mm -hmm. Don't know. Uh, it, there's nothing that's written on it. There's no insights into what Mr. Putin is thinking, but that is a feasible scenario because in all reality, would the world really care? Yes. If, they, if they dropped a nuclear weapon on ISIS, would the world really care? Um, don't know. Uh, yeah, uh, but there's the, that's a, I think that is something that does go through Putin's mind, and he has certainly considered it, but hasn't had to go that direction because he's having at least some luck on the conventional side. Thank you. Um, is anybody else? If I can chime in for a second to add to the great uh, uh, response to your question. In my also, in addition to what Colonel Gentle said, uh, in my opinion also, um, I think Russia will continue mostly hybrid warfare in the meantime. So we mentioned the term, the gray, gray, gray zone. That's the term, by the way, of the special forces. So um, it seems to me that all sides are trying to avoid the conflict as much as possible. So uh, utilization of the nuclear weapons, it's not excluded. But it, at this point, I think it's unlikely yet. But it could get to that point any time. Because as I said, the, the conflict of interest are getting quite to a dangerous point sometimes. Um, we could I uh, witness that particularly when the, 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 the United States dropped a mother bomb in, in Syria and uh, how the Russians reacted. Obviously, they didn't expect that. And there was, of course, we know there's been some coordination between the US and Russia in terms of the operations in Syria, but something didn't work out. So it again proved another time that things cannot go well at any minute. So. That's why we talked about this unpredictable world. So any other questions? Yes, sir. I'm uh, Major Arrigo from Albania. Thank you for a very comprehensive uh, uh, briefing and thoughts. My question is uh, to Dr. Gab. How does Shanghai Cooperation Organization affect the relation China and uh, Russia? How effective they have been? And second one, China has decided already they are creating the, the world, not world, but Asian bank and how this bank is going to af affect the World Bank, which particularly is run by, controlled by the United States. I, I didn't understand the first question. Uh, how does the Shanghai Cooperation Organization oh, affect Shanghai. relation Shanghai. between Russia and China? And as far as I know, in 2008, they have a treaty about the border conflicts they solved already, so. Uh, I, I did say this in the presentation, but I probably should have. I do not know in history where China and Russia have had a better relationship than they have right now. And that started in 1996 with the Shanghai Cooperation Organization setting the stage in Central Asia for the movement of goods between uh, Russia and China being prepared to take care of any terrorists or 
uh, unconventional warfare threats in, this, in Central Asia. And then different eight nations have now joined this Shanghai Cooperation Organization. So the first thing that you would expect to see if China-Russia relationships start to break down would be problems within the Shanghai Cooperation uh, Organization. So I think it is, if you're filling out an, an indications and warning matrix of China-Russia uh, relations, that how well they cooperate across that sh with within that framework uh, is very important. On the second question, the United States, I think, made a big mistake in that Asian Investment Infrastructure Bank. When it first was announced, the Obama administration tried to talk the other nations in Asia to not go along with it. And just the opposite happened. As soon as the Chinese said, we're going to open up this investment bank, and money's going to be available, nations stream to it. And so we've kind of changed our mind on that and now are applauding it. Um, the question is, <laughs> how much money are the Chinese really going to lose uh, in some of these projects? Uh, because the, the one belt, one road right now is not making anybody any money. Uh, the Pakistani army had to build a new infantry division to protect the infrastructure from Gwador uh, up to the PAC border and the Karakaram Highway to Kashgar. And, and that's like building roads through Rocky Mountain National Park um, on a daily basis and maintaining it. Um, so one, it's not, a, it's not an easy structure um, and, and it's going to be very costly. Uh, but we have, I think, did the right thing and said, great, if the Chinese want to invest in all these nations and they build up the infrastructure uh, so that it helps the global economy, that's the other thing that, that <coughs> President Xi said. We're ready to accept globalization, and they are working on globalization. So the question is for the United States, uh, are we going to you know, stay and, and play, or are we going to withdraw? A and so... I think we should stay and play, but that's a. Uh, and UK joined I'm not already the that bank as well. Either UK joined already that bank as well. So. Yes. So please introduce yourself. Major Tanner Garrett, Staff Group Seven, Charlie. Uh, this question is for all of our panelists, and uh, we talked about Russian-Chinese relations a bit. And how do you gentlemen see the relationship between Russia and China developing uh, as the Arctic space becomes uh, more prominent on the world stage? Whom this question to or anybody? Oh, I'll, I'll just get. I'll start with just quick. The the Chinese are all over the opening of that route because it saves like nine days if you go from Shanghai to Antwerp or Shanghai to Rotter, Rotterdam. It saves a lot of money. The other thing it does is it opens up the European market more to China. So the the Chinese, it's another reason for the Russians and the Chinese to play well together. Uh, because the Chinese really would like that route open, and they'd love the Russians to pay for it. John, did you have a? The Chinese have more icebreakers than we do. And the Russians too. The I expect the Russians. They don't have Alaska that's on that territory. Mm -hmm. They got more icebreakers. Please use the microphones when you speak, that we can read. Yeah. Um. It was. I'm sorry. It was on your slide. I I yeah, yeah. Yes. No, no, Dr. that was perfect Please. because you are the China hand. Uh, I am not. But uh, from my perspective, yes, uh, uh, I, I see that uh, both Russia and China uh, will very aggressively exploit uh, any, any uh, uh, openings in the polar ice cap uh, very aggressively. And uh, as a matter of fact, one of our MMA students has written, uh, just wrote a, a thesis on, on that uh, this year. And some of our Canadian officers are very interested in that situation as well. Uh, I don't know how our foreign policy establishment uh, is looking at that, but uh, at least, uh, you know, Canada, uh, Russia, or China certainly are, are very interested. And China, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, Dr. Bab, but I, the way I look at China, they are actively trying to put out their tentacles, their economic influence all over the world, including uh, what we call Latin America. Uh, 
uh, the Nicaragua Canal is a prime example. I don't think they have a, an intent to take over territory. I think they, are con they will be content if, as the Middle Kingdom, they are the hegemon and the dominant power uh, on, the east, on the South China Sea. I think that that's their objective. And they can look at it that as a rightful historical objective. But they do certainly want to be a world player in the economy. And they want to have those tentacles spread about the whole world, including uh, real, right next to our backyard here. And that's, that's their interest in Cuba at this point. Uh, so from my perspective, uh, they don't want to dominate the world uh, militarily, but they want to be the economic powerhouse uh, globally. If that makes any sense. Yeah. Sure, from the military perspective, I think as long as uh, the Chinese have freedom of navigation through the Arctic, I don't think you'll see any, uh, any military conflicts between Russia and China regarding that area. Is that answers your question, sir? Very good. Um, just to quickly add, the way the China acting, for example, and Russia acting, uh, we, uh, we call that in the book, the strategic military culture, which are different. It's a combination of historical cultural factors. Like I would say that China, because of different strategic military culture, would be acting mostly through economic means. If we're talking about, for example, Japan or Germany uh, or Russia, there would be a combination of military uh, capabilities as well as soft power. And we could see that like uh, the, the conventional force involvement uh, during the 2008 Georgia-Russia conflict, or what they were doing in Ukraine, Tali, uh, Estonia, in Norway area, etc. So it's kind of the different strategic military cultures. Um, so uh, any questions, please? Any comments? Yes, sir. Mark Wilcox, Staff Group 1, Bravo. I, I, I'm, I apologize that I, I had to leave for transgender policy training, so unfortunately I missed all the presentations. So, so if I make a comment that you already covered, just throw something at me or something like that. Uh, for Jeff Babb, I have no questions on China because I don't care about well, China at all. you're a Yankee all. fan. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Anyway. I, I like I, your Red Sox well. tie. <laughs> Okay, I just want, just want to offer a couple of comments based on, on some, some things that I heard uh, that I want to clarify, um, particularly from Colonel Gentile's comments. You, you talked about military power, economic power, and, and, and the cultural aspect of power. I think it's important not to underestimate how importantly the Russians look at that cultural aspect, particularly right now. As they're looking at a competitive relationship, one of the levers that they do use is culture. And contrasting the, the more conservative culture that they say they represent with the more decadent culture of the West. Uh, it's very much part of the Russian narrative and very much part of they what they do. It also ties into their use of, uh, you know, take your pick on what you want to call it, Russian speakers, Ruski Mir, the Russian world, those who are, have an affinity to forward towards Russia. They're very much trying to exploit that as well. And I think a per third part of that too is their appreciation for the importance of the information space. How, you know, they've just recently developed their own information strategy. They're very active in terms of information discussions taking place in other fora. So I think the culture piece is, is very, very large for them. Um, a, a piece on the military, too, I, I think on the question came up on what else are the Russians doing in terms of conventional forces and things like that. While they're devoting a significant amount of the resources towards nu two nuclear forces, and in fact, Defense Minister Shoigu was just in front of their Federation Council today touting how wonder, what wonderful things are doing in the armed forces. We see a lot going on with Russian conventional forces in terms of their, of how they behave strategically. And for Russian conventional forces, strategic is within the boundaries of the Russian Federation. One of the big areas that they emphasize, one is command and control. They've, they've built a much more sophisticated national command and control structure from, from the very much over the top Dr. Strangelove type headquarters they built in Moscow. If you ever want to see some pictures of a wild headquarters, look it up for their National Command and Control Center. But also building those in the, form, in the military districts throughout the country to exercise command and control not only of armed forces, but the rest of the federal government. It's, it's quite impressive. And we see it demonstrated every year because the Russians do a large scale exercise in one military district every year, in addition to the hundreds of other exercises they do that demonstrate Strategic mobility, the ability to shift forces rapidly from one military district to another, 
Um, for instance, taking forces from the Western military district going down to Tajikistan for an exercise. It's quite impressive what they're doing with conventional forces. And tie that in with the new weapons systems. I think we see the conventional forces playing as much a strategic role and perhaps uh, addressing some of those deficiencies in terms of deployed forces, stationed forces, and not having enough people in certain places. And then, of course, a lot of this is these large, these snap exercises we hear so much about where we're suddenly out of nowhere, the Russians decide, let's have an exercise, and suddenly thousands and thousands of soldiers are meeting. So I think in terms of certainly worthy of looking at the strategic forces, because absolutely the Russians see it's very, very important, but the conventional forces, they're, they're making significant advances there as well. So not really a comment, but just a, uh, not really a question, but just a comment. So thanks for the opportunity. Absolutely, Mr. Wilcox. That was great, and thank you very much for your uh, comment, we should have invited you to provide the chapter next, next time. Definitely we'll do that. Um, so uh, any other c uh, questions, comments, please? Don't worry about the time. You can make a comment for one hour. Just, just kidding. <laughs> but uh, uh, the length is not a problem. But all your comments, questions are very interesting. Please. If no further questions or comments, uh, there is a common request for our, from our panel. To, be, to have an opportunity to answer the comments from Dr. Wright. Who would like to build the first, please? I think Lee already answered the, the question I had for him. Dr. Gentile already answered. Dr. Babb, would you like to begin with? It was a great question. Is In terms of Africa and the South China Sea, how does this influence the relationship between China and Russia? In some ways, they're dis disconnected. Uh, you d the Russians, it's th the question of Africa, I think, is more related to the Kaplan's upcoming problems in the, with, between India and China, because the Indians are also heavily involved in, in Africa. So in the book, Monsoon, Kaplan says, the center of gravity in the Indo-Pacific, uh, Indo-Asia-Pacific region is shifting to the Indian Ocean. So that is there. Now, the, the South China Sea, I think that the Russians look on as, if you look at the flashpoints between the United States and China, they are North Korea, Taiwan, South China Sea. And, and sometimes I think the Russians are probably just sitting back with glee and watching the South China Sea unravel and, figure, and figuring out how we're going to do this. It, it was Chiang Kai-shek and the Nationalists who drew the nine-dash line, and some people say it was an 11-dash line. Um, and so the Chinese have really said, this is our sovereign territory. They don't care what different world courts or bodies say about it. But the, Ch the Russians have not said hardly anything about that. I, I think anything that keeps the Chinese and the the United States involved makes the Russians happy because it, it diverts attention from the, the big problem, which is back in Europe. Dr. Hernandez, do you yes, have? Yes, I have a, I have a couple of uh, comments to uh, Dr. Wright's uh, uh, question. Uh, I'm, I'm very interested in this uh, Mackinder's idea of the uh, Colombian moment, and uh, I certainly see the Eurasian powers, both uh, Russia uh, and, and China, uh, getting out of the uh, of their natural habitat, if you will, uh, of the Eurasian uh, heartland, the, the landmass, and because of globalization, extending those tentacles into the Western Hemisphere that for the 20th century uh, has been really uh, an American hemisphere. So I see that as a as a new development uh, that perhaps hasn't hasn't has flown under the radar screen because of our focus on the Middle East and, and places as, as, you know, Eastern Europe uh, and such. But it certainly is, uh, is a development that has the potential to, to be a game changer in our hemisphere. So, uh, yeah, very interesting observation. I also, with in regards to uh, um, aid to Haiti and aid to Mexico, I found it uh, fascinating because I've been thinking in those terms lately. Um, uh, where is the Monroe Doctrine at this point? Uh, is, has, it, has it disappeared? Is it valid? 
for those of you who, who want to know more, uh, uh, the Monroe Doctrine was formulated in the early 19th century, a declaration, a unilateral declaration by the U.S. that uh, events in this Western Hemisphere uh, would be for Americans in the broad term of the word. It, Americans meaning South Americans, Central Americans, and North Americans. And, and that, by the way, was initially very well received by people such as Simon Bolivar, the liberator of uh, Venezuela, Colombia, etc., because it, it, it was intended to exclude the imperial powers from business in the Western Hemisphere and allowing the new republics, including the United States and other new republics, to flourish. So it was initially very well received by our southern neighbors. Eventually, it became a, an instrument of power politics uh, unilaterally uh, by the United States, uh, famously by Teddy Rose, Roosevelt's implementation of the uh, big stick policy and gunboat diplomacy. So it became very negative and uh, perceived very negatively uh, at the turn of the, cent uh, the 20th century. Um, some initiatives like FDR's initiative uh, in the 30s of the good neighbor policy and some later initiatives, such, such as uh, President Kennedy's initiative in the 60s of uh, providing assistance to Latin America, have turned around that policy to, to provide it a, a, better, in a better light. But I don't think the issue has been resolved. Um, uh, I think we have an opportunity to reshape that policy. Uh, as I said, Secretary Curry uh, said it was a, a thing of the past, but evidently, uh, as, as Kaplan points out and others, you know, we cannot ignore geography. We, the United States, are still the dominant power that, if you look, take a look at the map, covers the Caribbean, uh, the, what I call the Greater Caribbean Basin. So where would, would that Monroe, how would it develop? How, how would, it, would it evolve is a, is a great question. And going back to Mexico and Haiti, for example, which are, uh, in one case, a failed state in the case of, of Haiti. In the case of Mexico, we can describe it as a big democracy, but it's this dysfunctional, and it may be on the way of failure. Uh, well, in my personal view, uh, that is an oversight of policy. You know, we have disasters that are on the verge of occurring in our backyard while we are diverting billions of dollars uh, to Saudi Arabia, to the Middle East, to other countries that. Uh, you know, have been our focus for whatever reason. So in my personal view, we have ignoring uh, this simmering disasters, and we may, we may have to look at that and pay the price uh, 20 years, 30 years down the road. Mexico City is one of the mega cities, by the way. Uh, huge problems, it's a mega city. And if you look further south, Sao Paulo and Rio de Janeiro are also mega cities. Uh, so we have that uh, evolution going on as well in our hemisphere. So from the hemispheric perspective, we have both a challenge and an opportunity. But I do think that it has been overlooked too long, and it's almost like second tier in fo important foreign aff affairs, you know, uh, and such. So uh, very good point. Uh, obviously, I'm biased because I'm looking at the hemisphere, but uh, I, I don't think the, uh, that those problems can be ignored. Uh, long into the future. Um, it, does that make sure. sense? Sure. Open any okay. questions. So. Okay. So, uh, yeah. Uh, thank you. Anything, Dr. Wright, from you? No? Okay. Anybody else? Very good. Wow. So many questions, comments today, as usual. And uh, that concludes. Any other questions, comments? Okay. That concludes our session today. Slide, please. So, this is the final slide. Just uh, with the contact information for any related questions, okay? And we'll uh, let everybody know when the video is posted on Kremlin website to support your missions, to support your professional development. So this concludes our session today, and we look forward to seeing you again in the future. Every two, three months, at least we're trying to do the sessions. And thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you, Don.